it was then that I personally, speaking for myself, uh, once again realized, and my views were there and then confirmed, that if we do not move rapidly there and then uh, with the unbanning process, the, the releasing of Mandela and others, we would lose this uh, generation of, of young white uh, South Africans. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today, we have a South African lawyer, politician and activist who served in the National Party government. Leon Vessels was first elected a member of parliament in 1977, representing Krugersdorp, where he currently still resides. He has held various ministerial positions, like the Deputy Law and Order Minister. Leon, thank you so much for making the time to join us on Worldview. It's my, my honor and my privilege. Thank you so much for having me, Donald. Leon, um, I, to be honest, I feel that the intro didn't really do you justice. So perhaps can you give us some more background and expunge on what I've already said what is the background of Leon Vessels? So what what positions did he did he um, held in the in the in the government of South Africa, the previous governments of South Africa? Well, uh, I served as a member of parliament, as you correctly said. I then served as a member of the executive uh, in various capacities. Then I had the good fortune. Uh, immediately after 1994 to be the deputy chair of the Constitutional Assembly, the body that wrote the South African constitution and was chaired by uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, of course, they're not uh, a president, but uh, a leading light in ANC circles. Uh, after that, I uh, was nominated, invited, and served uh, for 10 years as a member of the South African uh, Human Rights Commission, uh, which was a very joyous occasion. But beyond my political career, I also um, studied uh, again, and then received a doctorate in, in, in law. And I became a honorary professor at Northwest University and served in different capacities at that university and also at the University of the Free State. So that is Leon Vessels. Amazing. And Leon, um, you were quite involved during some of South Africa's most tumultuous times, like um, during, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but during P.V. Buerta's downfall, and then if, if W. de Klerk's rise, um, what did you make of these two situations? What, for example, what do you think would have happened if Pivia Buerta had not had a stroke? What do, you think, what do you think the future of South Africa would have looked like if our former prime minister, Pivia Buerta, did, did not have a stroke? Well, to, to, to integrate the two positions, I think South Africa was on the verge of... of of a breakthrough. It was only a matter of whether it was going to be a transition smoothly negotiated or, or by force. I don't believe that the National Party uh, or anybody for that matter was keen to make this a fight to the finish. Those are not my words, but the eminent persons group uh, who arrived in South Africa uh, on behalf of the Commonwealth at the time, uh, came to that conclusion in the mid 80s that they didn't come across anybody in South Africa who wanted to make this a fight uh, to the finish. So the spirit of constitutionalism and uh, uh, democratization was deeply embedded in the South African society, maybe not in the thinking and the minds of the leading South African politicians. But I do believe that the 
broader South African uh, society was not going to let go of that ideal. And when do you think this change really happened? Because some would say it started as early as Prime Minister B.A. Forster, that he started to become more practical in, in the sense that things need to change in South Africa. It, it, it cannot go on as it's currently is with the system of apartheid. When do you think it started with B.A. Forster, P.W. Boerta, um, F.W. Clark, or when do you think really this, this change in mindset started? Well, thinking from an Afrikaner National Party perspective in that sense, I think Foster unleashed powers and dynamic uh, momentums and, uh, that he, he did not foresee at any stage. So when Foster first appointed the so-called Vian Commission and the Rickert Commission, both those commissions reported in the P.W. Boeta era. And uh, it was almost government by commission. By that, I simply mean the National Party did not have the solutions for our country and then had to fall back on commissions such as uh, the Vian Commission and, and the Rickert Commission, who, who unleashed forces that not Foster or P.W. Boeta would have uh, predicted at the time, at the moment, uh, when first it was uh, the commissions were charged to do their work, and secondly, when they reported. But at, beyond that, it was clear that South Africa was not going to be the same. Trade union movements uh, now operating legally, um, and, and, and furthermore, the Rickert Commission in particular highlighting the the scarceness of uh, and the lack of, 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 of visionary South African uh, politics, uh, the, the hard economics and demographics had spoken through those commissions to the National Party leadership. Were you surprised um, when F.W. de Klerk announced the unbanning of the South African Communist Party, the ANC and the release of Nelson Mandela. What, what, you were probably in the parliament at the time. How, did, what, how was the mood like and what was your reaction like? No, I was not, I was not surprised. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. Firstly, uh, it, 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 was, it was hard politics, uh, mid 80s, second half of, of 80s that a solution uh, was without the ANC was not a realistic prospect. In other words, no, no agreed settlement would, would stand the test of time and public scrutiny if the, if the ANC wasn't part of it. But that was not national party uh, policy at the time, but this was what uh, broader South Africa had, had demanded. What did surprise me about FW was the manner in which he went about his business. Uh, he moved rapidly. I, I, that did surprise me, but it didn't start. It didn't start on the 2nd of February when he made that, that public announcement. He, he was inaugurated in, uh, as state president in September 1989. And from that moment on, uh, he moved like lightning. Uh, first of all, uh, the democratic march in Cape Town, which was one of the biggest marches uh, ever at the time, when FW then said to the organizers, you are pushing uh, against an open door. And, and, and that, got, I think, got many participants and observers by surprise. That was a first surprise that which I experienced firsthand uh, then at that moment as the Deputy Minister of Law and Order. And, and I was charged uh, to, to interact with some of the organizers of that march and to ensure them that it, uh, it uh, we would uh, 
allow the march to proceed and, and not intervene and allow it to be a peaceful march. Uh, that, uh, uh, the individuals involved that, that I interacted with or was charged to interact with was certainly um, surprised and, and, and welcomed that initiative. Then secondly, uh, uh, later in the year, I was present uh, then as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs at a very uh, small meeting, uh, which I still regard as, as, as being very privileged to- Is this now under Pukwota? He was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, yes. I was the Deputy Minister and FW, Magnus Milan, the Minister of Defense, Baron Duplessis, the Minister of Finance and myself, were there, but but I couldn't attend, and I was then asked to to represent the Department of Foreign Affairs at that meeting. It and FW as the head of the South African Defence Force had had called for this meeting to to be briefed by the security uh, about the security situation by um, the Defence Force, and midway through that presentation. And this, in my life and in my world, was a momentous occasion when FW stopped them and said, there is no peace scenario in your planning, and there will be peace in Southern Africa. So two things dramatic had happened. Internally, he had, uh, in, in modern jargon, he had democratized a march. Secondly, he had the vision of peace in Southern Africa. And then the third step, which was, which he deliberated upon for a while with colleagues, but then finally was the announcement that the ANC would be unbanned, Mandela and others would be released. So those three steps, uh, being a close observer in those momentous occasion, I often say, I didn't make the history, but I had a ringside seat when history was made. And um, Leon, what, what is your opinion of a, of a man like Pek Buerta? Because he was he was a minister of foreign, um, I don't know precisely the title, minister of foreign affairs uh, for yeah. quite a long time. What is your opinion of this, of this man? He, he was considered uh, quite a flamboyant figure. He was a flamboyant figure, but... Uh, I think one uh, to do justice to Pagwata, one must go back uh, when he entered parliament as a backbencher in, in 1970, and then made his maiden speech where he uh, said that South Africa cannot ignore the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we need to move closer to, to that declaration. And uh, people were not so pleased with a backbencher lecturing them on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I do, however, believe that it, it must have taken a lot of courage at that moment for him to make that speech. And then in the mid 80s, in the midst of all the turmoil, uh, all the violence, states of emergency, security clapdowns. But Buddha did make the speech. Uh, he, he responded to a question at a press briefing where he, he said, well, I'm willing to serve under a black president. Now that uh, got him again into serious trouble with P.W. Buddha and others, and he was he was forced to eat humble pie, but uh, I think he, uh, in his heart of heart, uh, that the, the, the quarrel was really that he, as a member of cabinet, should not be allowed to, to make those kind of bold public statements. But be that as it may, that was typi typical Pugwata flamboyant, uh, involved in solo flights, speaking his mind, difficult to discipline, 
uh, and and not a, not always a good team player uh, from from the broader national party perspective. Fascinating, Leon. Um, so uh, you mentioned an interesting point where you said that the negotiations could not have stopped. Okay, I'm paraphrasing now. You can perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, but the negotiations could not have taken place without the African National Congress, the ANC. Um, but there's some people would argue that the ANC did not enjoy widespread support, a majority of widespread support in South Africa amongst black people. I mean, there are few academics um, that would argue that, for example, the Inkata, and they would later be known as the Inkata Freedom Party under Mongosuti Butulezi, Prince Mongosuti Butulezi, they enjoyed much wider support. And they would say, but why did you need the ANC to negotiate with if you if you could only just negotiate with Prince Butulezi? And I think, for example, Thatcher was also in favor of Butulezi taking over as opposed to Nelson Mandela because of their record, their communication with the South African Communist Party. So what do you think of those opinions? I find myself in extremely difficult terrain, uh, terrain to speak on behalf of the ANC, but I, I, I would like to believe I was a, a, a serious observer, albeit as a backbencher in the late uh, in the late 70s and, 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 and the early 80s. Now, uh, I, 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 I pause for a moment, I interrupt myself by saying to you that in the mid 80s, I uh, was a visitor in the, in the United States and uh, I saw all the violence on their television screens that were not shown on the South African television screens. And I was deeply disturbed by that. And on my return, uh, I had uh, resolved and said to myself that I would make a, a, a serious effort now to speak with as many uh, fellow South Africans across the color and the political divide as possible. And during those interactions, in spite of the fact that so many of that generation had never seen Nelson Mandela, they only heard of Nelson Mandela, what they were told by their parents, the grandparents. And you must remember that there was a ban on, on, on uh, ANC publications, ANC utterances, etc. But all of them, in the quiet confidentiality of our discussion, said Nelson Mandela has to be released, and he is the unquestionable leader of the struggle politics. I uh, at at that stage, uh, which I regard as very fortunate. A, a good relationship with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who also comes from Krugersdorp. He went to school as a young boy in Krugersdorp and who said to me that, you know, I am not going to be party to negotiations or lead any negotiations if the ANC is not unbanned. Now, I say this with respect to, <laughs> to, to Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and, and, and former colleagues uh, in the National Party and also uh, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, that because he was not advancing the idea of, of a violent overthrow, we've, we enjoyed speaking with him and we enjoyed his utterances because he was against, uh, he was opposed to sanction, he always made good uh, conversation. However, he was never at, in a serious poll among South Africans going to compete favorably against the popularity of Nelson Mandela and the ANC. 
But isn't there a distinction between the ANC and Nelson Mandela, perhaps, in that sense? Not quite, not quite, because uh, you must remember the ANC, uh, their external, uh, externally, internally, Robben Islanders, etc., all embraced the one notion of, of an undivided South Africa where uh, each and South, each and every South African would have equal rights. And they didn't uh, No, I think you cannot in any way draw a fair distinction between uh, Mandela and the ANC. They were one of a kind. Even if you read the history of the ANC, how Mandela was, albeit isolated in Robben Island, and 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 wanted to, to to start a negotiating process, always at pains not to alienate his colleagues, his former colleagues, and 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 the opposite. One must remember very clearly that. Uh, Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo, uh, who were not together on Robben Island, Tambo in exile, Mandela on Robben Island, were partners of the same law firm. So they knew one another uh, in and out. And, and the one was not going to in any way uh, outmaneuver or, or betray the other. Yeah, um, what I meant was that, for example, it seems like the ANC presidents always enjoy more popular support than the ANC. Uh, I just take Ramaphosa, for example. Um, Ramaphosa has a higher approval rating than his party, the African National Congress. I think it's like a 20, 30 percent split. So it might be that people uh, would much rather see Nelson Mandela as the president of South Africa, but perhaps they don't like his party as much as he perhaps himself that too and think, that, that I, extends I think, to this very day no i i think it's an unfair comparison and i'll tell you why i say that there wasn't a free flow of information and political activity at the time when nelson mandela was was a prisoner in robin island and once he was released he became the face uh, uh, of the ANC, and and even at that stage, uh, it took a while to for for communication uh, to filter through all, all the ranks. The current situation, where uh, Mr. Ramaphosa is more popular than the ANC, makes a lot of sense, because uh, not not to. Uh, not to overstate my case, but uh, but when uh, uh, Mr. Ramaphosa appears on television, uh, he does come across as, as someone who is uh, on top of his of his uh, of his topic, whatever he is speaking about, and he just owes a lot of confidence in that sense. Whilst if you if you delve deeper down into to, um, the ANC's lack of performance at, at the local level, the poor service the delivery that you will experience uh, at the local uh, municipality level, or the lack of electricity or of water, etc., you you find this very strange contradiction almost where people blame the ANC but uh, are not so harsh. Uh, apportioning blame uh, to Mr. Cyril uh, Ramaphosa. But be that as it may, it's undoubtedly true. Uh, at the current, uh, at the moment, I don't think it's true in the, in the era of Nelson Mandela, as, especially after his release and that those few years uh, during negotiation. Interesting. Leon, um, do you think sanctions were needed? to bring down the apartheid government? Do you think, because obviously I think a person like Nelson Mandela believes it was needed. And I think you've also mentioned that Prince Butelezi thought it was not needed, or perhaps it would have disadvantaged South Africans more than uh, the, the pot potential benefits of sanctions. Do you think, what do you think of sanctions? Well, of course, uh, 
I was on the side who opposed sanctions, but be that as it may, it will be pretty naive to argue that sanctions didn't play a role, but it would also be pretty naive to argue that if it, that sanctions was the main driving force why, why South Africans and in particular uh, the National Party had, had changed its position. I think uh, it, 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 it may be correct to say it was a, a wee bit ingenious, but it doesn't give recognition to the soul searching that that uh, that was taking place in, in 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 broader white national party environment in the churches in in the business community in uh, in the universities amongst the younger generation i may just give you one uh, if if you will allow me i'll give you one just, just one slight example uh, uh, Nelson Mandela was not in uh, unbanned, uh, released, and the ANC had not been unbanned. And uh, Johnny Clegg had a concert in Johannesburg uh, after his world tour. And I had read a lot about uh, Johnny Clegg and, and was keen uh, to, to understand him better. And I was also keen to, uh, to, to, to feel the spirit. Uh, at that uh, concert in Johannesburg, and I took a, a group so, of young. So, sorry, Leon. Just a, just for our viewers, Johnny Clegg um, is a singer, I believe. And he, uh, what's what's some of his famous songs? Uh, well, the, the, the Johnny Clegg was a South African singer. They they often refer to him as the so-called white Zulu who could speak, uh, who could speak Zulu fluently and understood the culture. And they had this 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 wonderful uh, African beat and and rhythm uh, uh, in his music. Um, they often said that he was more popular in Paris than Michael Jackson, because they had concerts more or less the same time, and he was uh, uh, he had a packed audience uh, at that concert. So when when. Uh, this group and this this younger generation and I uh, participated in that concert. He said inter alia that he was in in Europe when at the collapse of of the Berlin Wall, and that he hoped that this year, namely 1990, would be the collapse of the apartheid walls and that Nelson Mandela would be released. And that whole audience, the majority white young South Africans applauded him to that. And it was then that I personally speaking for myself, uh, once again realized and my views were there and then confirmed that if we do not move rapidly there and then, uh, with the unbanning process, the, the releasing of Mandela and others, we would lose this uh, generation of, of young white uh, South Africans. So that, that was the, the climate at the time. Leon, but some would argue that um, by moving too rapidly, um, <laughs> we, we've spoken to people like Peter Grunewald and senior figures of AfriForum, by moving too rapidly, the National Party made some serious mistakes and that they conceded too much to the African National Congress. And that's why South Africa has so many problems to this very day. For example, they would cite the issue of federalism, that South Africa is too of a unitary state. And if we had more powers devolved to provinces like the Western Cape, we wouldn't have all these problems. It's that we gave too much power to the African National Congress. What what would be your response to that? Well, it's it's uh, it, it sounds almost unfair to argue with those uh, sentiments in their absence. But my, my position uh, is that I think we move too slowly. In, by moving so slowly, we missed a lot of opportunities, and. 
And I also think some of those who now argue federation failed to explain to you what their position was uh, when the notion of federalism was entertained in the late 70s and, and early 80s. Uh, their notion was, was opposed to feder uh, federalism, uh, saying, listen, uh, federation is power sharing. Once you share power, you lose power. And therefore, uh, you will be confronted with black majority rule. That is the, what the history will reflect on their positions and, and, and my position in, in as far as uh, moving to slowly, moving to rapidly. There were, there were golden opportunities uh, in the early 80s. You, you must remember some of the folk you've mentioned here uh, uh, broke away from the National Party. And, and, and I have, I cannot, I, I want to say this, I want to speak in exclamation marks. They broke away from the National Party because we inter alia allowed colored children to participate in the South African Craven Week schools rugby. I mean, that's how how the politics played itself out. And at that juncture, federation- so, Sorry, Leon, uh, is that why the, the Conservative Party started? Because of- uh, Well, the, the Conservative Party broke away in 1982. One of the issues at the time was the resistance to a colored boy participating in mixed sport activities at the Craven Week. And subsequently to, subsequent to that, P.W. Boota uh, launched the idea of, of accommodating the so-called colored people in South Africa to be part of our constitutional dispensation. And that's why they broke away. That is the reason. Now, my argument is they would in any event have stepped back and formed their own party, regardless whether we had incorporated black South Africans in that, that dispensation, yes or no. So that was a missed opportunity. We were already doing battle with them about small, tiny, little issues. And we should have been bold there and then. And, and we would have suffered the same loss of support. It would not have been larger or smaller or anything. That's my view. That was the early, that was the early 80s. They then vehemently opposed the referendum in 1983, which had absolutely nothing to do about federations and, and, and uh, the accommodation of so-called black African politics whatsoever. I fought two S elections. Sorry, Leon, 1983 or 1993? No, 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 no. I'm talking about a, a referendum in, in 1983. Oh, sorry. First of all, what, what that is that was refer a referendum about the tricameral parliament. Oh, shall oh we, okay. Shall we proceed or not proceed? So in 1987 and in 1989, I fought Fierce uh, elections here in Krugersdorp against Clive Darby Lewis. And let me tell you, those elections of which they were party, in other words, against the Conservative Party, had absolutely nothing to do with federations, yes or no. I remember the Conservative Party walking out of the National Assembly in 1990, when FW announced the unbanning of the ANC and the release of Nelson, their comments then was that FW's speech was the most revolutionary ever listened to or made in that parliament. So given that time year, a uh, time span of, of the 80s and, and, and um, the 80s, so to speak, uh, if one, if one uh, 
carefully analyzes that decade, it was a matter of missed opportunities. And, 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 and let us not forget that uh, many of, of, of the groupings that, that you've cited were dragged, kicking and screaming to the, to the negotiating table. I remember uh, Codesa 1991, they were absent. They didn't even participate uh, in, 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 at the kickoff at Codesa. They were dragged, kicking, kicking and screaming right up to the elections, finally. Uh, so so that, that argument of moving too rapidly does not hold water on all accounts, no matter how you look at it. It was rather a, a question of missed opportunities all along. I, I, uh, I smile when I hear the argument about Federation being overworked now. I remember in the, in the late 70s, how many of the, of the conservatives in the National Party who went on to form the Conservative Party um, were opposing, they were, they were even opposing in the late 70s. Some of us uh, um, adventurous young backbenchers speaking with, with Mangasutu Butelezi. I don't think it's a true reflection of, 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 of what happened in South Africa. So, but be that as it may, most opportunities most opportunities here we are now, and we have to uh, to deal with a situation that nobody is really satisfied about. That's a fascinating. So basically, what you're saying is, if I understand it correctly, Leon, is that um, the, the the Conservative Party back in your time they were actually perhaps more for a unitary state as long as white people or Afrikaans people governed that state. But once the tune changed and now they realized black people had to get involved, now all of a sudden they said, okay, no, no, now we want the folk start, federalism and all that, all that comes with it. When, that's, yeah. And, and once I they, think it, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but I think we, I, I will also try to be fair to them. Uh, and in that sense, I might have misheard you, but their position uh, in, in the early 80s were that there would be a white Afri a white state run by, Afri by Afrikaners and that no black person would be a citizen of that state. That was their position. And that was the position they held even in 1987 and 1989, when I was doing the fighting those battles against uh, Clive Darby Lewis, and their vision was a, con a confederation of states, not a federation uh, of, of different uh, components, but a confederation of different states. In other words, an independent Transkei, an independent Bopotatsana, an independent this, an independent that and it would be a commonwealth of states, so to speak. Federation uh, is, a, is a tighter unit. It, and that's why they dismissed the notion of a federation and embraced the notion of a confederation. But even in their own ranks, people like their, their leader, if uh, Andri Strernich would argue that all federations finally result in federations and we are opposed to it. But, but, but to accommodate their point of view, the, their idea of, of strong local governments and strong local communities certainly hold water in a variety of, of uh, scenarios. However, if the notion is that that the idea is a, clo a closet white racist Afrikaans, Afrikaner 
community, it will not hold water. It will not stick. And often their slips are showing. I don't want to fight with them. Uh, those are battles uh, gone by, but as you can sense, I'm still uh, energetic uh, when, when I get involved in those discussions because I do remember those debates clearly at the time. Yeah, perhaps we should organize a discussion between you and uh, Mr. Grunewald. Um, well, I don't think it. I don't think it will suffice. Not that that I am uh, uh, opposed to that discussion. I think uh, one must must also appreciate that uh, Dr. Grunewald has moved on. I mean, he's not advancing the arguments of, 19, of 1982. He's advancing arguments of the year uh, 2022. So it's a completely uh, a, a new set of circumstances and history and a, an argument or a debate between him and me would be about uh, us fighting for a better past and not for a better future. Mm. Yeah, you're actually echoing his statements that we should um, fight for a better future and stop fighting for a better past. Whatever happened in the past, that happened yeah, in the yeah, past. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I have documented my views. Uh, uh, it's been documented in, in, in two uh, prime books. The one uh, is called, for, uh, it was in Afrikaans, Vereniging die Onvoltoide Vrede, in which I said that 1902, uh, was an unfinished peace at the Treaty of Vereniging at the end of the battle between the Boers and the British. And then I subsequently wrote a book which was published in 2020, which is called Encountering Apartheid's Ghosts from Krugersdorp to Constitution Hill. And in that book, I explain the journey and I deal at length with the battles fought against Clive W. Lewis and the positions he held, but be that as it may, we are not, we, it's Vereniging Krugersdorp is part of our history. Constitution Hill, constitutionalism uh, is part of our future. And, 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 and I have to acknowledge this, that my understanding is that uh, a lot of those, uh, what I call constitutional dissidents who say that we move too fast are all using the constitution to protect their rights or their arguments or to advance new ideas and new arguments. Interestingly enough, perhaps in those days they could not have done that. Um, I think perhaps if they had stood up against the national government, perhaps they would have been censored. So perhaps now they're enjoying more press freedom than they would have done originally. More press freedom, uncertainly, um, undoubtedly true for, for now and then, um, um, broadly speaking, but uh, amongst uh, the more conservative and the more enlightened kind of uh, Afrikaner debates, um, I wouldn't say official state censure in that sense, but the broader media favored our arguments more than they did favor their arguments. That is true. Leon, what do you think? Okay, we, we've recently, um, the only reason why I asked this question is because you have served, correct me if I'm wrong, on the South African Human Rights Commission. And um, we've recently had a court case, an equality court, where the Kill the Boer song was deemed not to be incitement of violence or um, uh, I can't precise, okay, you can help me the, the legal term, right. but the, the EFF basically, we are allowed to sing that song. And obviously it will be appealed. It will probably end up in the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. But what do you think of this case? So, and what do you think of the relevance of this in 2022? Well, this, this, uh, this particular slogan or the chant uh, has been with us for, for a long, long time. I remember vividly also that in, when I served at the Human Rights Commission, the, uh, Mr. Grunewald, and in particular, uh, 
filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission and ultimately the Human Rights Commission at the time uh, overturned its own decision on appeal by saying, well, no matter how you look at this, this does instill a, a form of incitement amongst the Afrikaner community. And then Grunewald, uh, Dr. Grunewald applauded that, uh, that, that approach. And, and I associated with that, that particular approach. And we were of one mind uh, at the time. But unfortunately, uh, this, is, this must have been at least uh, 20 years down the line, the legalese of the argument has taken over. Uh, so the judge who found this uh, in this matter that it wasn't hate speech says, well, there wasn't sufficient evidence before him to, to, to pronounce on it and declare it hate speech. However, I, I do believe that what is lacking, I'm not criticizing the judge, what is lacking is a broader South African debate about the dignity of all South Africans. And it's just cheap politics that is uh, uh, doing the rounds and then finds its way into, into the courtrooms. And then you, you find yourself in extremely difficult terrain because the legalese then take over. And the, so the legality, legalese uh, rule and, 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 and plain common sense is, is thrown out through the window. And that is the, the, the disconcerting part about that argument for me. And I think probably people don't really understand, and perhaps you can help me, me or our viewers understand this more completely, is that the Equality Court is not exactly a very um, upper class, or uh, how would you say, um, uh, a, it's not the Supreme Court of Appeal or the Constitutional Court. It's, no, one, of the, it's one of the first courts you uh, approach, like a magistrate's court, where, and then you appeal it from there. I mean, it's not... I mean, it's probably going to go through quite a process before this decision is really going to be resolved. Well, an equality court is is a is is an is is a court uh, pending on the circumstances parallel to any other court, a magistrate's court or a or a uh, or a, a high court, a, a supreme court. In this case, in this case, a judge presided over the matter in the in the high court that sat as an equality court. But that is not the, the final word has not been spoken on this matter. It will go through th th undoubtedly, and I think it will be a good thing, uh, uh, through different legal processes to the Supreme Court of Appeals and most likely to the, to the Constitutional Court. So, so lawyers will tease it out and the legalese, as I say, will once again uh, will once again uh, run the outcome of all of this. You see what what has happened, and this is a quarrel I have uh, with the ANC in particular. Is beyond ninety four beyond uh, when we had the democratic election, and beyond ninety six when we had the uh, the the approval of, of the South African constitution as we know now know it, the ANC suffered from negotiation fatigue. Negotiation fatigue in the sense that they believe they are the only ones blessed with wisdom and, and visionary views about South Africa's future. And the whole idea of sitting around a table, talking, speaking, not negotiating in, 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 in the true sense of the word, but listening to the views of the broader society. As someone so eloquently said to me, uh, democracy is a noisy place, but you need adults in the room. And, uh, and, and, and the current situation 
uh, is of such a nature that there are many individuals uh, in the ANC who believe they, they are blessed with the supreme knowledge uh, of, of all South Africa's ills. And do you, do you um, attest that to, to, to your ideology? What do you think is holding back the African National Congress? Is, is, I've, I've just spoken to a, quite a young um, individual involved in politics, and he says some of the problems is it's, it's an older generation that just doesn't want to let go of ideology and um, the struggle. The struggle is still in their minds. They're still part of the struggle. And that's why I keep bringing up even even a DA is part of the National Party or in, it's it's against the struggle. It's against the National Democratic Revolution. What do you think is holding back the well, African National Congress? Well, uh, I think we have to take a broader view uh, than just the African National Congress. Isn't this a world challenge? People are saying when are these baby boomers going to retire? When are they giving up? Uh, they, they just keep on working. They just keep on occupying seats and, 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 and not enough space is created for, for the, uh, there's a, the, some say next generation, some say the new generation, uh, whatever you like to call it. So I think the ANC is challenged by exactly that, that particular notion as well. When do the, the adults in the room realize that a next generation has to own their time? But the next generation also has to acknowledge that there has to be space uh, for, an older, uh, for an adult in the room. The adult in the room, however, must realize that they, uh, they can't dictate they now uh, they have to master the art of listening and they have to listen to the next generation and, and i think those are challenges with the which the anc and the broader south african society and uh, society in the world uh, are experiencing right now it seems like we need sort of a blend between the wisdom of the older generation and the ambition and the drive of the younger generation that's always you the see, middle ground yeah, the middle, the middle ground is, is, is at times a place uh, where the accidents happen. So it's a dangerous place to be. I think the older generation clearly, of which I regard myself uh, as a part of, as you can hear, I speak of the 70s, the 80s, and I refresh uh, your memory about things that, that happened before your time. But we've lo we have lost the art of listening speaking for myself and my generation. And I think in that, in that sense, the new generation has, has to stand up and own its time. And in that sense, there has to be a blend. And the blend is not that all of us should think the same and speak the same language, but to to respect the views we uh, we hold, and and share experiences and share views, and uh, and encourage my generation has to play a larger role, and in encouraging uh, uh, South Africans and and society at large. And yeah, that's a very interesting point, Leon, uh, because the person I just mentioned that I just spoke to. Um, you made almost precisely the same point where he says this is sort of an entitlement amongst the younger generation and they need to step up. If they want yeah, to succeed, yeah. they need to own it. They need to take responsibility and stop um, accepting that it is just their future. They need to take the responsibility of the future and make decisions that is, if, if they want to step up, they need to take they need to start having that authority and speaking with that voice if they want to take up leadership yeah it, it's absolutely amazing when one uh, sits down and 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 listen debate and 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 speak uh how different the worlds are uh there's a lot of frustration in 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 the ranks of 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 a new generation 
and the frustration, and I uh, don't want to uh, to overemphasize the point, but they want solutions here and now without the past. And the challenge, and that's my view as another generation, the, the challenge is not to live in the past, but to find ways how do we, how do we, uh, not to live in the past, but find ways how to live with the past. In other words, dragging the past into the future. You cannot escape the inequalities, the unemployment, uh, the poor service delivery, all of that. That is a hard reality, and it may be part uh, of the vestiges of national party and apartheid rule. But you, you cannot escape it. You don't have a magic wand. And some, I mean, some people would be so motivated to do something, you can always make a situation worse. Um, so we, we must always be conscious of that fact that any solution doesn't mean necessarily that that solution will make things better. I mean, they are... I mean, no, there, there are, for example, debates in Parliament where the EFF would argue um, there's a lot of lawyers and advocates who would appear before the Commission and say, if you do land expropriation without compensation, uh, things it, things will dramatically be worse in South Africa. And then they would argue, but we've been to the townships, things are already terrible. But, I mean, the correct response to that would be... <laughs> Just look at Zimbabwe. I mean, when they followed land expropriation without compensation, things got even worse. Now you have a situation in Zimbabwe where people are now struggling just to get food. They're, they're yeah, I mean, they're basically begging for anything in Zimbabwe. Uh, I think like thousands are dying just from poverty, from hunger. Well, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant uh, to... Uh to invoke the, the Zimbabwe example, because we've been driven with the Zimbabwe example for, uh, for, for, for many, many, many years. Uh, many years, I'm talking about the early uh, 80s. I remember, I remember uh, posters uh, in, in the election in 1981. We don't want to be a second Zimbabwe. That was in 1981. But the hard reality is that South Africans do not know how uh, fellow South Africans are coping. In, by, by, by that, I, I, I simply mean we are still dealing with the old divides in, 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 many, in, in, in many respects. Uh, and, and that's why uh, this is a harsh example. But I've done inquiries with a Human Rights Commission hat on when one section of the student community would uh, be concerned about a sparking space for his or her vehicle. And the next student would be concerned with where will the next meal come from? And though that, that is the hard reality of South Africans. And because we don't, we are quick to point fingers and apportion blame, but trying to come to grips with the hard realities of, of our society uh, is, is, is a huge challenge. And, and it takes effort. You cannot simply sit in your study or in your living room and, and, and have a sense and a feeling if you only read the newspapers and you all only follow events on, on your television screen, you have to be in the midst of all of this to, to have a true sense and a true command of what the facts are. And Leon, why do you attribute this to, um, this um, inequality that it seems like you're describing? Is it uh, mainly the, the fault of the National Party? Is it the fault of the ANC? Is it 50-50? Is it 75-25 percent? Who, who is responsible for this and who do you think, what is the solution to this? Well, it's a complex, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex issue there. Therefore, you, you, uh, the, it will not be a one-trick pony. There, there'll have to many, be many elements to this. You can apportion blame to the National Party saying, well, they demarcated 
the townships, there was a lack of development, etc., uh, in the broader South African society, be that rural or be that urban. That's one argument. But having said that, you also have to acknowledge there, there was a lot of wasted uh, money in, in, in terms of, of, of corruption, theft, lack of maintenance of, of infrastructure, et cetera. And then some would carry on by saying that that was because of the policy of cadre deployment, et cetera. Uh, so it's a complex matter. Now you cannot solve complex matters if you employ old uh, solutions, the same old solutions which, which, have, which have failed. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, the solution is to be found amongst South Africans. And you, you, you have the spirit of that. The spirit of the Comrades Marathon, which was run this weekend, reflects the spirit of South Africanness. And I'm fortunate to say that that spirit of, of, comrades, of the Comrades Marathon is something which I enjoyed when I ran Comrades uh, in the early and mid, mid 80s. And I was inspired by the spirit of the comradeness at the time and, and the broader spirit of of, of South Africanism, uh, and, and I'm still uh, excited about that, and I'm still inspired by that sense of the broader South Africanism, rubbing South Africans rubbing shoulders with one another, and not uh, fighting about uh, the issues we advance all the time. That's it. Okay, so Leona, are you are you optimistic? Do you think the spirit is going to carry us, and in 2024 and beyond, we can do this? South Africa can once again, like they overcame the obstacles in 1994 or prior to 1994, we can do this. We can we can get South Africa together again and overcome the difficulties. Yeah, I am. I'm absolutely uh, optimistic. I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh when I rub shoulders with my friends and colleagues in the broader uh, civil society organizations, I'm not so optimistic. When I look at, at, at the party political squabbles that we are uh, exposed to, and that is the reason why you find me more and more in the company of civil society organizations but ultimately, I cannot deny that the, the, the main game will be played in parliament. So therefore, we have to hold politicians accountable. We have to inspire them to rise above their party political squabbles. Well, thank you, Leon. This has been such an interesting conversation. I see we're running out of time, and I really I want to thank you for your time and making this possible. I, I really enjoyed this. I want to give you one last opportunity. If you want to add something, say something to our viewers, or just answer a question that you'd hope I'd ask you. Well, uh, two comments. First of all, there's no finish line uh, in, 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 in these matters. Uh, the baton is passed on from one generation to the other, but hopefully we'll be able not to drop the baton, but to inspire one another. And democracy challenges us to be uh, vigilant at all times. Thank you, Leon. That's yeah, very inspirational. Thank you so much. And to our viewers, you enjoy this content if you've made it this far. Show your appreciation by liking this video, sharing it as widely as possible to share Leon's perspective and subscribe to our channel for more such content. My name is Donald and you've been watching Worldview.